Welcome to a special year-end edition of the France 24 debate. I'm Francois Picard. Legend has it that General de Gaulle once asked, how can you govern a nation with 265 sorts of cheeses? It certainly rings true. In a France fraught with rivalries, even dairy is an identity issue. Of course, when de Gaulle said it, France didn't have hypermarkets. And if the French stare into their grocery cart today, they may wonder if their world hasn't become well too, how do I say this, pardon the pun, a little too homogenized and pasteurized. If you're ready to stomach the argument over raw milk, cheese, and the reason why the French can quarrel till the cows come home about what's best served between the main course and dessert, well, then draw up a chair. This table conversation goes well beyond our borders. Today in the France 24 debate, say cheese. The whole show, by the way, uh, we can blame it on Florence Villeminot, host of France 24's French Connections show. A year ago, you asked, because uh, we did a show on wine, and you're the one who said, hey, Why what... do we do cheese? <laughs> of course, <laughs> they go well together. Uh, what kind of cheese goes well with wine? Well, Pierre Brisson could easily have answered that one. He grew up in Beaujolais, where his father makes Morgon wine. Uh, and you do much more than make cheese. You uh, give, I love this expression, caseology. Caseology. Workshops, yes. Caseus is cheese in Latin, and logos is the science of the art of. So it's like the in the wine, the cheese version of a wine uh, analogy. Yeah. So is, voilà. a so fancy way of saying you're a cheese taster. <laughs> I taste cheese a lot. But yes. you make I'm it as well. I make it a little bit for pedagogy because I'm in Paris, so I don't have the the animals on my garden. <laughs> <laughs> so I I source the raw milk, a sort of raw milk, and I make cheese for pedagogy. All right. Uh, also with us, Véronique Richet Le Rouge, journalist, chair of advocacy group Fromage et Terroir. Cheese is an, I guess, terroir, how do you translate that? Homesteads. She uh, lobbies tirelessly in favor of small farmers and handcrafted cheeses. Uh, after The Crying Cow, her latest book in French, Main Basse sur les Fromages AOP, uh, the great cheese PDO heist, I guess you could say, the, the great PDO cheese heist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, per, per, PDO means protected designation of origin. Now, flying the flag for French cheese, an industry that employs 300,000, does 30 billion euros worth of business at home and abroad, Laurent Damiens, communications director for the how do I say it? The C-N-I-E-L or the CNIL? Which, CNIL. The CNIL, excuse me. <laughs> the National Dairy Industry Center. Yeah. Th thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, the France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, hashtag F24 debate, also on iTunes. And uh, Florence Villeminot, why do the French get so worked up about cheese? <laughs> because cheese is such an integral part of our culture. It's something that French people are very proud of, uh, their cheese. As you were talking about that, uh, that de Gaulle quote that comes up all the time about uh, how can you govern a country with 265 varieties of cheeses. Well, France has a lot more than 265 varieties it's of cheeses. It's even worse now. <laughs> it's even worse now, exactly. That there are perhaps up to 400 distinct mm. kinds of cheeses in France, and it's something that French people are very proud of. Because that's something also very French is uh, it all has to be enshrined in the law the names of the cheeses. Indeed and each one is made in a very different way you can see this this cheese map of France uh, uh, it's a really good way of actually discovering France is traveling around and tasting all the different cheeses and of course tasting the wines that sometimes uh, go along with those cheeses and the truth is, is that French people eat a lot of cheese according to a study from 2013 uh, French people eat on average 25.9 kilos of cheese per person per year. So that's about 26 kilos of cheese per year per person. Wow. That's a half a kilo a week or 70 grams a day. Now, if you compare that to other countries, that's what's really interesting. In the U.S., it's around 15.5 kilos of cheese a year. And in the U.K., 11.6. So you can see we eat a lot more cheese uh, here in France. And it's true that French people tend to eat more industrial cheese than they do artisanal cheese. It's, it's more accessible, perhaps cheaper as well. But, but people are very much attached to artisanal cheese, uh, cheeses that have been made using the same techniques often for hundreds of years. Uh, and actually, let's listen to uh, some artisanal cheesemakers talking about just what goes into making these cheeses. There's a lot of love and a lot of sweat and perhaps a lot of tears as well. Take a listen. We do the same gestures they did back in the day, by hand, without any machines. It's a great job. You end up with a great product. It's physically demanding. You have to work it. But I love it. 
I love being in contact with the milk every day. It's a hard profession and fewer and fewer people are ready to work 15 hours a day. That's why a lot of cheeses disappear. So you can see there's a lot of hard work that goes into making those cheeses. It's, it's quite a physical uh, profession, I guess you could say, and it's a profession that t takes a lot of time out of the day as well. I mean, first of all, you often have uh, uh, people who you know have their cows or sheep, etc., on the on their farm, and then they get the milk and then they make it there as well. So it's quite a labor-intensive uh, 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 production. Uh, and also, just making the cheese is not the only thing as well. You have to make sure that the cheese that's eventually made becomes delicious. And there's another word for that in French. It's called affinage. Uh, it's to take a cheese and to let it, I guess, become more mature, let it age in certain conditions. Sometimes you have to brush the cheese. Sometimes you have to apply a liquid on it to make the flavor uh, the best it is. And, and once again, people who do this, this job, the affinage, take it very seriously. Uh, let's take a listen to some of, the, of these affineurs. Once you've started working in this profession, you begin to love the cheese. You've got to take care of the cheeses like they're your children. We call this place the kindergarten. You really bond with the cheese. You know exactly what's going on inside each one. So yeah, talking about cheese like children, and uh, I guess it just shows how much love goes into making those cheeses. Uh, th those images of uh, uh, of the people going in there and, and moving the, the stirring the, the, the milk around, it's a bit like... Uh, you know those old images we used to see of uh, vintners uh, crushing grapes with their feet uh, after after the harvest? Is that something that's dying or is that still very much alive? No, it's still very much alive because you, you, you can um, hopefully uh, for the farmers and hopefully for the cheesemakers, the technology uh, can come to be at the service of the tradition. So uh, more and more the most physical part is getting a bit uh, easier for the for the for the cheesemakers, but at the end there is still some uh, things to do that can't be replaced by by the by, by machines by machines. Voilà. and the way you cut the curd into pieces, the way you get everything, the way you mold it, uh, it, it does have a big big impact on the on the results. So these handcrafted cheeses, what what percentage of the French cheese industry do they make up? I mean, we can say at least 25%. A quarter? Yeah, a quarter. It would be still traditional, maybe... 25%? Yeah, like <laughs> it's less. Yeah, I mean, what we could say, PDOs and other local cheeses could be around 25%. Then 75% are a little bit more industrialized or, or really industrialized. But as you said, we try, even with industrialization, to keep the gesture of the original human gesture to make the cheese because it's not so easy to make cheese. So even if we can, we try to make it less hard for humans, still it has to be very close to the human uh, hand. Are you saying machines will never be able to do everything? Absolutely, definitely. Uh, something I guess that uh, you'll agree with, Véronique richel rouge No, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, uh, today, the technology uh, is very uh, big in the cheese and you have 90% of the cheese in France are completely industrial and you have 70% seven, of PDO industrial and from, from PDO is very very small part of the of the cheese in France so today unfortunately I give a bad side but uh, the farmers are disappearing uh, each year they close because it's too hard. And the, the society today, women wants to, to work with in office. Uh, you want to have your weekend. You have to, you want to have yeah, holidays. Yeah, dairy farming is terrible. And because, it's completely, yeah. if you make camembert, yeah. it's every day, yeah. every month. And you got to milk those year. cows Christmas and Easter and every day of the year. Yes, and the farmers for camembert, they, they make two, two times of a day. Of day. Twice so it's, a day. it's a very hard job. And today in camembert, you have still two farmers. In Epoise, you have one farmer. In Long, PDO, very nice PDO, you have one farmer. And I can give all examples like that. So we don't go to the nice side. But hang on, let's talk about this word PDO again, protected designation uh, of origin. That means that uh, if you get that label, that there are strict rules... Yes. And you're saying there's still industrialized cheeses? Is that what yes, you're arguing? Yes, they buy the, the giants, the milk giants, buy the small fromagerie 
you know. So there's, it's not a it's they, not a stamp of quality then these PDOs. Yes, they, they 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 have to respect the the specifications, you know, but they try anyway to move something to make more volume, to make a big production in Cantal in a, a lot of uh, form d'Ambert, form de Montbrison. Today you have Lactalis, Sodial, and and few uh, big giants, and that's all. You have nobody today. At the beginning of 20th century, you have many, many, many farmers. So we lose, you know, a lot of uh, knowledge. And it means that we lose landscape. Uh, when, you buy, when you sell your cows, it's what happens. It's maize, uh, corn, mm, corn, corn yeah. coming at the place. So it's moving. France uh, so is moving today. Every time you sell your cows, it's a centuries-old tradition that's dying, is what you're saying. Pierre Brisson? Uh, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, thing because, the, indeed, we are losing farmers because they are going into retirement. And then that's a very hard job because whether if you're happy, if you're sick or not, if you, uh, you had an argument with your wife uh, last night and you still have <laughs> to make the cow every morning, every evening, you have to make the cheese twice a day for certain cheeses. Uh, so that's a, that's a hard job indeed. And um, on the other hand, you have uh, those uh, PDO's um, uh, rules, but they are not the same for every uh, PDO's. So some of them have been very uh, well made to protect small uh, artisanal uh, cheese production, like uh, the, 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 for instance, the Comté. Uh, Comté cheese, which Comté. comes from the Alps? Nice not from, from Jura. Not from, from Jura, excuse from me. Jura. Um, with, um, Beaufort. 40, 50 years ago, everyone would look at them think they are not very serious. But they got very, very, very uh, good at uh, protecting the, the cheese. So every uh, cheesemaker uh, making Comté, every fruitier, so every uh, cooper cooperative, uh, yeah. that's how we call them, fruitier in that region, yeah. um, they have a very, very strict way of making And the, the quality cheese. of the Comté has gotten better, is what you're saying? Is 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 getting not necessarily better, uh, because it's a natural uh, product, so you uh, you have to find, it depends on the season, depends on the uh, uh, what what the cows have been eating, etc. But the breed are protected. Uh, you, it's in its extensive uh, agriculture, it's not intensive, so you, if, you, if a farmer wants to produce more, more milk for the fruitier, for the cooperative, he has to extend the land. He can't just push the production of the animal. And not every PDOs have the same type of rule. So certain PDOs have been getting more uh, margin on the side okay. to, to be able to industrial more, industrialize more the product. So that stamp of approval, that PDO label, doesn't mean the same thing according to which part of France you're visiting. Yes, because in the different regions, the milk is different, the cows are different, and the product is different. So, of course, it's different rules. Some rules are very restricted, some rules are less restricted. But at the end of the day, it's still a regulation, it's control, it's controlled by France, by the EU now. So you are sure that you have this product and it's not another product for another region. So it's a very good system. Uh, it has been recognized by the EU more than 10 years ago now. Uh, we have it in France, in Spain, in Italy, in most of the, uh, of the European countries, and it's uh, in development. And many countries in the world, like in the US, uh, are trying that to do some PDOs as well. So I think it's a good system to protect an origin of a, of, of a good product. But this system doesn't protect because it's, and it's not a quality label because it's different. So if you buy Comté, okay, you will find a nice quality because what you said, the specifications are very strict. Roquefort also. But if you buy Cantal, Fond d'Ambert, uh, Osso Irati, Fond de Montbrison, and uh, many, many of them, you will find something, you know, not so high in quality. So mm, right. you cannot say today that PDO are quality label. That's wrong. You will find different things because it's diverse. I think diversity of cheeses is the word, and the regions are very diverse, and the humans behind the region are diverse. And so with this diversity, you cannot find something like one system that is okay yes, for course, everything. But when you we're we're going to take a look at what the different kinds of cheeses. But before we cut the cheese, the question, is dairy under duress? Uh, we've been talking about it. Small farmers uh, feeling the pinch. In the, they've been feeling it even more so in the two years since the end of European milk quotas. Now, they're fuming, even though world demand is steadily rising, an increase of 2.5% a year. The industry as a whole turning a profit. 
but it's not benefiting small producers squeezed by the price wars between wholesalers and the big supermarket chains. And now add to it, Franz Vimino, a butter shortage? It started a few months back. How can France be short of butter? Mm. Well, apparently it's because of the, these, this huge rise in demand uh, for for uh, milk, etc. But also because in uh, Asia, a lot of people are starting to like French pastries, and so uh, it means that uh, so French people had uh, had less butter because of that uh, rise in demand in other countries, and so that's why. Well, I see you shaking your head. Maybe not. So, that's not the reason. That's the no. reason we were told, though, uh, in the, the papers. <laughs> um, but it's interesting because in in countries like well, in countries in regions like Normandy, which which is known for you know being the cow the land of the cow the land uh, of butter the certainly. land of butter uh, you could you couldn't find butter in big supermarkets and so it was this it was a it was a really serious deal people were starting to get worried people were rushing to the supermarkets to buy there up was all a the run butter on they butter. could get uh, th there was a, the, it was a business uh, fight between the uh, big producers of uh, butter and uh, the supermarkets and the supermarkets the the, the big producers had um, uh, Invest in a way of keeping the 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 uh, the the matière première, the, the the raw uh, material, so they they could save it, and so they had the stock, but they had they hold it to uh, uh, while fighting with the with the supermarket. So the, it's 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 going uh, from January. The problem will disappear because all the production will be. Uh, we'll start over. Is your job to make both sides happy? Yeah, I think the reality... Were you that, caught in the middle of this butter war? Yes, we're a little bit in the middle, but uh, <laughs> we are not part of it. But the true thing is that the demand for butter has increased a lot right. in the world, in the States. And even um, in France, because people eat France. more butter. Because it used, yeah. to be, it used to be seen as being bad for your health yes, to eat butter. for many butter. years. But now they say that, you know, that those fatty, you know, what is it, the fatty acids or whatever that are yeah. in butter are actually pretty good for you, so people are eating more butter, which... <laughs> you know, and perhaps good. more cheese. We'll talk about it when we come back. We'll take a quick break. You're watching... The France 24 to be. Down to Earth, presented by Merit Dundas. The Arctic is going to be exploited, and the scale of this exploitation will only grow. We have a beautiful planet, we need to protect it and we can use space exploration to better understand it. Now we've, we've moved from, is that real, to what do we do about it? Join us on Down to Earth as we explore the incredibly complex relationship between humans and our planet. We're here to ask the difficult questions and find answers that may just surprise you. Down to Earth on France 24 and France24.com. Revisited, presented by Stuart Norville. Straddling the border between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the Aral Sea has a surface area of 66,000 kilometers square, twice the size of Belgium. In 1950, the Soviet Union diverted two rivers, which fed the sea, to irrigate their fields for large-scale cotton production. In 50 years, the Aral Sea lost 90% of its waters, leaving behind swathes of desert and ruining thousands of livelihoods. It seemed it was lost forever. But things have improved over 10 years thanks to a new dam. The water's rising gradually, with it the hopes of the inhabitants. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com. Hello, I'm Belle Donati. It's 7.30 p.m. here in the French capital. A reminder of our headlines. At least 41 dead and 84 wounded in a suicide bomb attack on a Shiite cultural centre in Kabul. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility in this latest in a series of strikes on Shiite locations. New revelations that three children of jihadists were repatriated to France earlier this month. Aged three, five and eight, they're now in the hands of social workers and foster families here in France. Meanwhile, French media is reporting that several suspected French Islamist fighters have been arrested in northern Syria, one of whom is suspected of having run a jihadist network here in France. Israel passes a controversial new law that curbs police powers in high-profile corruption cases. Supporters say it's protecting reputations. Critics say it's protecting the Prime Minister. 
And a former football player looks set to be Liberia's new president, with nearly all the votes counted. George Weir has won an election runoff with 61.5%. You're up to date with our headlines. I'll be back at the top of the hour with a full bulletin. But for now, let's get you back to the debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us, a special year-end edition of the France 24 debate. And we're having an argument about cheese. That's because we're French. This is France 24. And uh, with us to talk about uh, what to make of it all is French Connections, Florence Villeminot, uh, our in-house expert on... Uh, how do we say, clearing up quid pro quos. <laughs> clearing up cliches about Clear France. And a big fan of cheese. And a big fan of cheese. Uh, also with us, uh, Pierre Brisson, uh, cheese uh, maker, cheese seller, and I love saying this, caseologist. Uh, caseologist. Well, I, I'm, I, I'm a cheesemonger first. I, I age cheese in my cheese shop in Paris. I... And a reminder, the website, it's... Parole de fromager, like the, the voice of cheesemakers. Parole de fromager yeah. is the name of your of your yeah. of your uh, of your website, which is which is absolutely fabulous. Uh, Véronique Richet Le Rouge, uh, the, uh, the who heads the uh, advocacy uh, group uh, Fromage et Terroir, Cheeses and Homesteads, and uh, her latest book, uh, Main Basse sur les Fromages AOP in French. Uh, again, it's. Uh, the great PDO cheese heist, I suppose, is the way to, way to translate it about uh, the problems in defending handcrafted cheeses in this country. Also with us, Laurent Damiens, of uh, the French uh, National Dairy Industry Center, the CNIEL. Yes. I got it right. So, without further ado, Pierre, please explain to us about what we have here. For, for, before you, yeah, describe for us what, 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 what's in here. Well, that's good Small farm raw milk cheeses. Raw milk cheeses. This is real cheese. Well, <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> no, just, no, no. Uh, I, I, and, and actually, when you look in those two boxes, it is, uh, it's like a, the map Florence was showing at the outset. It's a tour of France, isn't it? There's a, there's all over, there's it's a little tour de France. Uh, here uh, we are in the north of France. This is the Maroual, mm -hmm. uh, made by a very good uh, farm called La Ferme des Ponts des Loups. It's a strong cheese. Strong, it smells strong because it's washed rind. Mm. Uh, that's a technique of uh, aging the cheese. You wash the cheese, the cheese with salted water, mm. sometimes salted water with brandy. Mm. <laughs> that's the case for the epois. And washing Burgundy the cheese. Burgundy cheese, epois. Exactly, Burgundy. It helps the, the, the growth of a bacteria, giving the reddish color and also a strong smell. So that's probably the reason why French cheese got the reputation to be smelly and stinky. Right. Voilà. But it's only the rind because the inside is much, much milder. Does it annoy you when people say, oh, they, they smell bad? Smell bad, but that's to 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 let the people liking good cheeses to uh, buy to eat more cheese for them. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> Here we are in the Jura region, and that's the Morbier, and from the same region, the Comté. This one has been aged for over 40 months. That's a very old one. Very wow, tasty, three year old very... cheese. Why right, over three years old? Yeah. Wow. That's a good one. And that's the Morbier with the line in the middle. You really can recognize that one because it has a line, and that's not mold actually. That's ash. That's ash. But it is mold there on that blue cheese. And this one? Yes. Small farm cheese called Bleu des Aillons, Bleu du Val d'Aillon. Uh, Which is where in France? From Savoie. Okay. From the Alps. From the Alps. Voilà. Um, you have a, um, quite a mild uh, start when you taste it. And then after 15, 20 seconds, you have a big group of cow coming back on the back of the palate. And it's, it, you, have, you, you finish in the farm. That's it. <laughs> and, and over there, what is that? A goat cheese all the way? Over here? That's a small goat cheese, yeah, from yeah. De Sèvres. De Sèvres uh, is uh, the center of France. Yeah. Yeah. Here you have, what is it? Ah, there's a quiz here. I can't see it. It's Saint-Nectaire. Saint Saint-Nectaire Saint 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 <laughs> Fermier. Voilà. Very good uh, one. Here you have... Is it, oh, is that the, the Pays Basque cheese? Uh, yes. Uh, also Irati. Irati style. Also Irati. And you can, you can tell it, it's sheep. Huh? Sheep, goat, and the rest is cow. And you can tell just by looking at the color. When the cheese is quite, really quite white, 
that's a sign of goat or sheep. Goat and sheep don't keep the keratin in the milk, so it's always quite white. The cow does, so you have a more yellow color. So uh, I brought some knives, uh, <laughs> and you're saying that there is, of course, a way to cut cheese. Yes. You know when French Florence people... Florence is nodding vigorously. Oh, yeah. You can, yeah. If you get it wrong, you can get in big trouble. Yes, especially with the grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the, it's when, we, when, when French people come to cheese, we always I have two types of conversation. Right. How do you cut the cheese, and do you eat the rind or not eat the rind? <laughs> right. To rind or not to rind, this is the question. It depends on the cheese is the answer, right, for the rinds? I know. It depends on the cheese, depends on the taste. The rinds gives, brings bitterness, so some people like it, some people don't. Right. And... The rind is not artificial. It's the action of salt and brushing and time that creates the rind. But what you judge is inside. So you judge the inside, but coming to the rind, it's about, it's about if you like it or not. And well, how to cut it? There is one simple rule to remember, and then you can deduce just by logical how to cut every piece of cheese. You have to give to everyone one part of the heart of the <laughs> cheese and one. and one part of the rind. So when you're about to cut... A cheese. You first have to check how was the big cheese in total. So let's say, up. Oh, I do this in front of the camera. Oh, Wait, I imagine turn, the whole turn it, turn it cheese. Turn it, turn it a quarter of a way. There you go. Voilà. Yeah. I imagine how is the whole one. And then I know that the heart is here, 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 here. Stop here. Because after I have the rind, after I have the rind, after I have the rind. So I cut the cheese like this and stop and then I have to change the way I cut the cheese because otherwise the last one will get on the rind. If I do this way, this one and this one will get on the rind. Right, so okay. You can't do that. So you're going to cut the cheese like this, like this, like so, this. So Pierre, is, is this essential? Uh, <laughs> bread with cheese. I know, it depends on the occasion. <laughs> ah, it depends. It depends if it's, it's a good, It's not essential, nice, says no. why, is it, why is it not essential? Because uh, for me, uh, I test cheese without bread. I prefer only cheese. R that's right. She said, I taste cheese. It depends if you taste or if you right. eat. No, but yeah. even if you I taste eat... taste cheese alone. Mm. But having, like, a, for a good sandwich uh, at lunch, oh, oui, for of a course, sandwich, it's of nice. Course. Yeah. To but yes. not crackers, not crackers, because British people... But bread is not an yes. do do obligation. Yeah. Crackers are milder. Huh? Mm. Laurent, what's your religion you can, when it comes to crackers? You can test with anything. In, in Japan, they like with uh, different things. With second. Rice. <laughs> Some people dip, eat, a, dip it in chocolate. With a good right. glass of wine, it's so nice, too. It depends what you <laughs> eat traditionally in your country. So mm. if you eat rice... You can eat it with rice. If you eat bread, like in France, and you want to do it the French way, you eat it with bread. If you want to test only, you can eat it by yourself. Yeah, but so people, just, they eat more bread than cheese. So, uh, it's a so just a reminder, your father is a vintner in Beaujolais. Right. He makes Morgon wine. Morgon, yeah, Morgon. Uh, and I always assume that cheese goes with red wine. <laughs> It's, it's like uh, uh, Veronique uh, said earlier, it's, it's, it's very uh, deep in our tradition that cheese with bread wine. But that's historically, we, people would continue with the cheese, the wine from the main plates. And as it would be meat, red meat, you would take like a tannic red wine. But when it comes to pairing, when it comes to bringing flavors, of course, tannins are quite dominating, so they would dominate the cheese. And that's why white wine is easier. But that's the, this doesn't exclude red wine. No, because when it comes to specific pairing, you can, you can discover incredible things. So mm -hmm. most, most white wines are not overpowering, is what you're saying, Véronique. And therefore, it, can, it goes easy. You, you'll get more of the cheese taste, whereas the red will overpower yes. the taste of the cheese. Yes. Anyway, 80% now, we know that 80% of cheese are going well with white wine. But you have some light red wine, too. So they can go with, uh, for example, Cantal uh, uh, goes uh, very well with uh, Gamay, a light Gamay. Uh, you have few examples like that. But usually now, white wine is more soft, uh, more um, little, uh, you know, acid. Mm -hmm. Acidic, uh, which uh, helps yes, counterbalance acidic. the creaminess of the and of the uh, is. You know, but it's a good a good rule of taste. thumb is to stick to the region. If you're, you know, tasting a cheese from Burgundy, well, then go with a Burgundy wine. If you're in Burgundy, you have white. Exactly, but uh, <laughs> white or red. But if you're in Normandy, then go with a local. Uh, you know, we were talking cider. Morgon, yeah. it's very strong. 
to uh, go no. to uh, with so wait the a cheese. Uh, you with have, a poisse, no, it's no, no, you have you have, have here you have yes, here a maroilles. Yes, it's gamay, but it's strong. No, gamay is light. It depends. Pierre, you have here uh, you right. have here a, a maroilles. Maroilles is the north. Does that mean we have to beer. drink beer with it? <laughs> yes, beer. <laughs> Champagne is good with maroilles, actually. Good. Champagne, is, Champagne is very good. Is and well. beer, it's but nice you can too. drink beer with wine. Mm. Why? Uh, with beer, with uh, cheese. Beer with cheese. Yes, 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 yes. Beer. Uh, you can when you work on pairing, you can play on different uh, different things. You can play on texture. You can play on flavor, and you can you can um, also play on opposition. Oh. So when it comes to those type of wine, but that could be quite um, a bit bitter, a bit um, uh, ammoniacal. Mm -hmm. uh, then you can play with the bitterness of the of the um, of the beer, but if you get it, um, there is so many kind of beer, there is so many kind of cider as well, so many kind of uh, wine. It's wrong to say cheese goes well only with uh, white or uh, with uh, something else because More. two things. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's a matter of taste. Mm. So we have to accept that some people's tastes are not necessarily the one that others. And also, um, it depends on the aging. You said earlier, like, a Cantal goes very well with the uh, Gamay. Uh, I, there is examples of uh, very bad pairings with uh, Cantal with Gamay. It depends on the aging of the Cantal. It depends on the wine, too, because you have exactly. light Gamay, you have strong Gamay. Exactly. So it depends. So many, no, it's exactly, something... Uh, so many exactly. So you, you can't say Florence it, like that. It's just interesting, because in, you know, in England, for instance, people like to eat cheese with chutney. Uh, and a lot yes. of people here in France are like, no, but it, it depends on the region, because if you go it, that Basque cheese, Often you'll, it'll come with a little uh, jelly, uh, cherry jelly, and so that's that. You know, stick to the region, stick to the customs oh. from the region. And well, for right. example, Pierre, thanks so much for that explanation. I, I need to turn at this point to Laurent Daniels and ask him because a lot of people are going to be saying, "Hey, uh, a lot of people watching from abroad, they're going to come away from from this from this uh, brilliant presentation a little intimidated, and they're yeah. going to be thinking, ah, oh, well." I, I I don't know if I can handle all of this. I mean, how how much?" Uh, you, you're, you're in the export racket. What do you tell people? Yeah, I, I mean, f from what you said, uh, if you go to Mexico, they would try the French cheese with mezcal, and they would love it if you go to... Yeah, but yet, because you're in the business of selling cheese, right? So you're yeah, going to say also, that. But is it true? Come on, tell us. The, the truth thing is that... <laughs> is, that is it really the true thing with is mezcal? That you eat the cheese the way you like it. So right. you pair it with what you like, you drink it with what you like, and this is your own taste. And so, of course, if you are in South Africa, in North Africa, if you are in Asia, you will you eat something different. So the, the French cheese will be like a French touch of your food, of your drink, but it doesn't have to be the rules like we do the rules. We like to do rules in France. This cheese goes with that wine, etc. And in fact, less and less we do rules about cheese, and less and less we say you have to drink that kind of wine with that kind of cheese. People... But then, are we losing the tradition side of it? Excuse me, I'm, I'm French. The tradition too, you know? was when <laughs> the tradition was when when the cheese was only eaten in the small region, in the small city. On, before Camembert, you only eat Camembert in Camembert, so you had to go to the city of Camembert to eat the Camembert yeah. 200 years ago. Uh, same for the other cheeses. Now the cheeses are traveling in France everywhere, in Europe everywhere, in the world. So now they have to adapt also, and the okay, culinary so of France has to adapt also. So how do you get French raw milk cheese to the other side of the world <laughs> without letting the produce rot at customs? Well, for that... We can introduce you to Liu Yang. He came to France to study economics, went back to Beijing from Corsica, knowing how to make great goat's cheese. It's an acquired taste in China, but elites and expats are eating it up. Oui, j'ai entendu parler de lui. Fromage de Pékin. We call this cheese French cheese of Beijing. The taste is French, even if the milk is local. Chinese people of a certain age don't like the taste of cheese. It is a product for young people. That's very interesting what she says, that, well, we're not going to really... You're never going to make a mark with the older crowd in China selling cheese. I'm not sure. I think uh, everywhere in the world people are trying... Is it a luxury product? It is a luxury product. In yes. China, definitely, because you have to make the transport. Uh, fees and then you have taxes in China and then many inter intermediate people so definitely it's expensive uh, it's not for every customer like in, in Japan it's even more expensive because you have sometimes like 400 percent taxes on so, some products so it's like a luxury products in the environment of food so it's not a luxury good no? 
But it's a small luxury in the world to have uh, French cheese. V Véronique Richer Le Rouge, uh, those handcrafted cheeses, those raw milk cheeses, right? They're in a way the salvation, right, of uh, uh, of a lot of these small farmers because uh, they, they, if they can find the suitable markets for it, then that that'll ensure their livelihood, right? But you, you mean in China or in France? Everywhere in the world. Everywhere around the world, right? That's hard to find anywhere raw milk. Or cheese. is it better if you're? Are you saying it's unrealistic to try to export everything? And we should just concentrate on doing. Yeah, I prefer to say, <laughs> you know, exportation is obsession. You know, everybody speaks about uh, uh, exportation, uh, selling outside. I think the better side to eat cheese is to eat local. You have to come in France. You visit the France. You go and you have the best. If you make uh, Camembert traveling uh, to China, it will be awful. So uh, you have to eat the camembert in Normandy or in France, okay? So eat let the you young be, in, in our cheese shop as well. It's not made to travel a lot. <laughs> right. You know, you, you have to make a difference between industrial cheese, right. okay, pasteurized. They can stay uh, in the plane. They can stay in the airport, no problem. And the raw milk cheese, uncraft cheese, it's difficult because it's moving with the weather, with the pressure, with the, you know, it's moving. So the test will be uh, very special. Pierre, Bris Pierre Brisson, your, your thoughts on this? Not every cheese should be exported? Uh, no. <laughs> Why? Because if we allow exportation, or if other countries allow exportation of all of our raw milk cheese, everyone would buy it, and we would not get anyone else. <laughs> so, <laughs> no exportation. For, for purely selfish reasons. It's a good, it's a good. This is very egoist. <laughs> but, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, mm, uh, some cheeses are so uh, specific to um, a season, specific to uh, small uh, productions. It's quite hard to try to... Uh, uh, globalize the, the, the typicity of, uh, of, of the production in order to export it as much as possible. That's, uh, this is a bit the schizophrenia of the, mm. the business because the uh, French people want uh, tradition, raw milk, artisanal, small farm, but they consume 95% of the time, they consume industrial or big, big, mm. su in big supermarket. Um, Even in Europe. Even in Europe, in it, Italy, it, in right. England, you can find very industrial franchise and that's very close. Mm -hmm. Why? So, so everyone mm -hmm. wants everyone wants uh, that tradition, but the uh, small market can't feed the population. No, it's today. not made for that. Quite hard. This discussion about cheese, it's again another tale of how France is conflicted when it comes to globalization. Of course, I mean, it's, that's the, France is, is full of contradictions, of course, and th that comes down uh, to cheese as well. I mean, if you talk to French expatriates, for instance, one of the first things they say they miss is French cheese. And uh, sometimes they try to buy French cheese, say, in the States, or, and they'll get a little taste of home, but it's still not the same thing as eating French cheese here in France. And that's f one of the first things that people uh, do when they come home is they go and uh, get some cheese and eat it, and that's the, like, the best thing that they've been missing. And at the same time, you know, if they could find that French cheese where they were living abroad, maybe it would lose what's special about it. You know, that the best French cheese is often... Uh, here in France, and it's just, but you know, it's the same thing uh, with uh, with other countries. I mean, if you could find Italian ice cream uh, here, then maybe you wouldn't want to. Well, I mean, you can find delicious ice cream here. I'm not saying that. But it's but, not you know, like it's not the, the gelati you get in Italy. Exactly, it's part of the experience as well of of going to uh, visiting a country or visiting a region is that you can get those delicious products there and only there. Laurent Damiens, you buy it that you can't export everything. No, we cannot export everything because many countries put regulations also. So we cannot export raw milk cheese in the U.S., for example, uh, or in many countries in the world. So only 40% of our product are exportable. Uh, but still, there is a demand for delicious cheeses mm -hmm. everywhere. So we try to find solutions. And, uh, and we try to work with the national authorities everywhere to try to make some real changes in the rules and so we can export now uh, raw milk cheese in Japan and they, uh, they buy a lot of raw milk cheese in Japan Really, and they love it. Mm. Yes, but the problem is that the people think when they eat this kind of industrial cheese, they think that th they are the best and that's wrong. I saw in Japan or China very bad cheese. It's me, you know, you see France 
on the cheese, so people think it's very expensive, and people think that it's the, uh, something very, very nice in France. It's something awful. So, uh, you know, you mm. have a problem of image because uh, it's not the reality, it's not the truth. Yeah, you know, I was... I agree with that. I agree with that. It's, it's, uh, it's a bit the same, but that's also the same problem in France. Huh? When you buy, uh, it, it, it when you buy Cantal, and seven, you know that 75% of Cantal production is pasteurized. Mm, right. You see Cantal, you see the PDO label, you are in a rush, you have a dinner with your friends, up, you pick up the yeah. Cantal, you say, oh, this is very good, this is Cantal, but you don't necessarily imagine that that one was made completely industrially and pasteurized. Mm. So that, that, that brings us to a fascinating question. In February, there's going to be a big sit-down over Camembert cheese. And Laurent Damiens, do you think that uh, you and Véronique richet Rouge will be able to bury the hatchet in February? Because let me just explain this argument. There, on the label, you have cheeses that say Camembert of Normandy, oh. mm -hmm. and you have cheeses that are, say Camembert made in Normandy. The made in Normandy just means it was assembled in Normandy, whereas the Camembert of Normandy means that it's the, the cheese, that everything is, that the milk is from Normandy, that it's uh, handcrafted, and that it is Normandy. Normandy. Yeah, like the, of Normandy is the PDO. So it's a very little region, small region in Normandy. It's not all Normandy, it's only a small area in Normandy. Three. And three yes, departments. three departments. So it's not all Normandy, actually. But you have other departments in Normandy when you can also do Camembert. So you cannot call them of Normandy because they are not in the DPO. But you agree with me that, no. that if the label says Camembert made in Normandy, it fools a little bit. Some people can yeah. get confused. Yes, but it's made in France also. No, no, <laughs> it's no. It's made in Europe. I'm so, sorry, I mean, but I have to, to, to say something about It's not about made, in, that. made in Japan or made in Tokyo. There are more Camembert made of outside no. of France than in France. PDO means that if you use no, it's not a, a PDO, name, yeah. a geographic name, in the PDO, you cannot use this, this name, the same name, outside of PDO. That's the, you know, a European text are very clear on that. So will you find a compromise? Will, will, will there be an agreement? Today, you today in Normandy, the Camembert is the only example uh, where you can find Normandy outside of PDO on Camembert from Normandy, no, uh, made in Normandy, sorry, and uh, of Normandy for the PDO, it means that they are raw milk, they, they, they are made at, by hand, and many traditional, uh, you know, production, and the other one, 90, 50 percent, no, 95 percent of the production is industrial. And so it means, yeah. okay, it's made in Normandy, but the milk, Come, can come outside. Nothing, no rules, nothing yeah. say that you can take the milk. You have to so take the be, milk. So will there be a Normandy. compromise? Do you think there's going to be a compromise? No, on no, you don't. We don't have to have compromise. We just uh, have to say stop for Normandy with the industrial. That's the only way, because if you let it wine, they will ask also to put champagne. Why? I was champagne, gonna, I, they I, want I, to take champagne too. I was going to uh, say, well, like one year ago at this very moment, mm -hmm. Florence, we were champagne. talking about the label champagne. It means nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for, what the, what the, I mean, you can find uh, similar wines that taste a lot like champagne, but it's important to keep that name champagne to a specific PDO wine from the region. I mean, PDO. It's not the same What's thing, because like Brie, you have Brie de Meaux, Brie de Melun, and Brie. Brie so tout court. Brie, Brie, only Brie. Okay. Only Brie, it's legal. Or you can say Camembert. Yes, but you Camembert cannot... Camembert in Hokkaido and everywhere. No, but it's Brie, you cannot put de Meaux on industrial brie, pasteurized brie. You, de Meaux is only the, for PDO. PDO. So Pierre Brisson, when you do your cheese tastings, I explained this, of course. It, it, how much of the time is taken up showing people what's on the label? It's, uh, I usually ask what's the difference between Camembert, Camembert de Normandie, and Camembert made in Normandie. Yeah. And eight or nine times out of ten, people uh, don't really know. So this is a problem that there is a confusion between Camembert de Normandie and Camembert made in Normandie. And that's actually uh, um, funny that you take the example of Champagne. That's exactly what happened uh, years and years ago about Camembert. When uh, Camembert, uh, Norman people try to protect Camembert, they have, they have been a fight, legal fight, because they, people were making Camembert elsewhere. They didn't accept to change the name, like the US for Champagne. Mm -hmm. So they, and the Norman people lost, so they couldn't protect Camembert. So they had to protect Camembert 
de Normandie. But at that time, they didn't imagine that indeed the industry would also want to do business with camembert. So they made the camembert made in Normandy. It's true the difference is subtle, but in, in, subtle in terms of uh, hearing, but it's very big in terms of In, in one word, when you, when you look at the way you have people from around the world coming to see you and everything, is the future of French cheese safe? Yes, if people accept to put the price on it. When you have camembert de Normandie, farm, small farm, even organic sometimes, one of the two farmers is one, organic. One is organic. Um, <laughs> when you <laughs> go to the farmer, yeah, you, the pay, you pay for the camembert yes, four euro, four euro fifty. Yeah. But it means something. It, could, it should be double. S spend a little bit extra for the, for the taste, says uh, Pierre Brisson. We're going to leave it there. That's going to be the last word. I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Laurent Damiens, Florence Villemineau, as well as uh, Véronique Richet Le Rouge. Thank you for being with us. And uh, well, let's hope there's plenty of cheese to ring in the new year for you from all of us here at France 24. Thanks for watching.